Hi, I'm Lori Jones, President and CEO of Avocet Communications and host of the Integrate and Ignite Marketing Podcast. Join me and my guests, some of the world's top innovators, disruptors, and visionaries as we explore bold and brave marketing strategies for scaling and growing your brand. Today, we're diving into the world of category design with the brilliant mind of Mike Bruno, category designer at Play Bigger and a seasoned expert in helping companies create their own unique categories. Have you ever wondered how certain brands rise above the competition and become category leaders? Well, Mike is here to spill all the secrets. He shares his insights on the power of creating a category for your product or solution and how it can propel your business to new heights. In our conversation, Mike walks us through a category assessment with 15 thought-provoking questions that will help you uncover the true problem your product solves. In this episode, you'll learn the importance of creating a category with your product, how to come up with a compelling category name, the process of assessing your company's category, the significance of effective communication in problem solving, the role of discomfort in achieving stronger outcomes, how recessions can provide opportunities for innovation and category design, and why understanding the cost of a problem is crucial. You'll also glean insight to an actual blueprint for a success surrounding category design. You won't want to miss this eye-opening discussion. So grab your notebook, your curiosity, and get ready to integrate and ignite your marketing strategy with Mike Bruno on the latest Integrate and Ignite Marketing Podcast episode. Let's unlock the power of category design together. Welcome to the Integrate and Ignite podcast. I'm so excited to have Mike Bruno with me today of Play Bigger. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Larry. I'm so happy to be here. Oh my gosh, Mike. I love, love, love this topic mm. that we're going to dive in today, which is all about category design, which is, I believe, and, and you obviously believe it because you're a category designer with Play Bigger, something that's actually vital to the success of launching a business. Before we get there, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey that led you to Play Bigger. Sure. Yeah. No. So an interesting journey. I started my career um, actually working in communications, um, trying to figure out how to get people to tell stories. Um, from there, I went to graduate school for psychology. I got very interested in cognitive science. I thought that's what I wanted to do for a career. The two um, actually work really well together. Yeah, yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah. And, and so so I actually went to, because I was so interested in creativity, what made an idea creative? What made something worth reacting to or paying attention to? And then I got turned on to cognitive science as well while I was there mm. and sort of these different biases and heuristics that people use to make decisions and how that sort of relates back to what I had been doing. Um, so I did that for a while, thought I was going to be a cognitive scientist. I ended up meeting an anthropologist who was working at Ogilvy. And I thought, that's interesting. Wow. Here's a academic yeah. social scientist. She was working with um, different um, uh, societies that were isolated from um, modern societies and, and, you know, writing down what she saw, observing what happened. She got hired by the advertising agency to, of all things, try to figure out what made bros want to drink beer. Oh my gosh, <laughs> so, I love it. So she, she would go with these guys to these bars and sort of write down what, what was happening <laughs> Yeah. when they ordered whatever beer and then with using these techniques from cultural anthropology and ethnography she'd be able to back out what the meaning of each of these brands was to these bros and she found well for you know one brand it was about trying to impress people at the bar for another it was like trying to show how sophisticated you are um, and then there was another brand which happened to be the one she was working on which was a Miller Lite. And it was about, this is just when you want to enjoy time with your friends, which is right. actually like an interesting insight. Oh yeah. When you think about it. You can be yourself with this. This isn't about pretense. Um, and really, I'm, I'm not saying it was her work that got there, but if you look at where that brand's gone, it is, you know, the every man incarnate. I mean, that's what that brand's all about. Well, and it's funny, as you're explaining all this, I'm thinking about the purses that I use day in and day out and how they tie into my mindset for the day, 
um, not only the outfit, but am I going out and I'm going to see people or, you know what, yeah. it's, it's very, very interesting. This, the behavior behind it all. What's, what are our symbols communicating for yeah. us? And that's what, I mean, I'm not an anthropologist, but that's what she taught me about, you know, and, right. and how people use these things. First of all, they're meaningless things when you think about it, but they imbue their own meaning onto these things. Yeah. I you know, love people it. People do. And then, yeah. and then you communicate something. So the point is I, I met this woman and at the time I was starting to feel, well, maybe academia is a little dry for me. I like to make things up and they didn't like that in the yeah. labs. You know, you're not supposed to make up academic research. And I think that's valid. Yeah. Um, so I started to wonder, is there a sort of in between where I could find this? And, and that's when she turned me on to um, strategy in, in communications and advertising. Um, and so that's what I did for 10 plus years, looking at um, different brands usually, and, and usually actually at the product level, and trying to figure out why anybody should care about what these brand marketers care right. about. Why? Why should the audience care? Obviously, we know why you care as a brand. Right. Like you want to sell more of your stuff and make some money. But what's the reason that any you know person in your target audience should care? And I found it interesting that you know a lot of times there was a I don't know, it's like almost like this brand ego sort of bias that would happen mm -hmm. at the brands where, where they say, well, the one thing missing with our target audience is that they don't have these features and benefits that we offer. And right. if only they had these features and benefits, their lives would be so much better. So in order to do that work, we would ground everything in two sort of realities. One, what is your business objective? What are you actually trying mm -hmm. to do? And what's your source of volume? Where are you trying to get that sort of volume? So if you're trying to grow sales, how are you going to do that? And there's sort of traditional ways of doing that, which is we're going to steal some share from the category leader. We are going to grow the existing category. So we have a 20 share, but if the category is worth a hundred billion dollars, that's mm -hmm. much more than if it's worth a million dollars. So let's grow the category. That could be a yeah. strategy. Or the, the last one, which we're going to get into today is develop a new category. A new what category. if we create a new category? And that's going to be our source of volume. Um, but the point is figuring out what problem you solve after that, why anybody would actually care. Your business objective and source of value, that's a brand problem, but that human problem, that's what I spent 10 years focused on. Well, and I think that's what most people skip. So they think to themselves, they're an engineer at a company <clears throat> and they think, uh, okay, this, this is missing in today's society. I'm going to develop this product because I know people need it, but they don't necessarily get into the science and the psychology behind why they need it. They go to market, it, you know, they, uh, they position themselves in a sea of sameness mm -hmm. um, because they don't have a good way to differentiate and and isolate the brand among the perceived competition or direct competition, and they fail within five years. And why, so first of all, define category design for us. And then why should, or why do companies skip this process? Yeah. Yeah. So, so like that problem perspective that I was talking about is exactly what drew me to category design and play bigger in the first place. Instead of focusing on, you know, one single product or marketing campaign with that problem that you could solve and have some kind of an advertising strategy, let's say behind that category design is about taking those ideas, but applying them not to the brand, not to the product, not to the brand, not even to the company, but to the entire category. And so to your point, when you, a lot of times I talk to a lot of uh, VC backed startups, a lot of the folks that we talk to are developers or engineers who have come up with a new way of doing something because they were working at a company that did that thing and they realized, you know, probably from some ingenious thinking. Yeah, they always is, are. <laughs> yeah. So there is some incredible technology, like a technology insight behind most of these startups by the time they come to us is really strong right. and impressive. And that makes a lot of sense. And when you're an engineer and you look at that, you can really appreciate how crazy what you've done is and how mm -hmm. valuable that thing is. I think a lot of times the perspective of the end buyer gets left out and people always overestimate how valuable the 
amount of the time you can save, the speed of something, the cost of something. So if we make something that's better, stronger, faster, you know, cost right. less money, logically, yeah, you should buy that. Except that usually there is a entrenched leader who's already solved that problem for the customer that you're trying to target. Right. So now you're coming in as almost a commodity and you're saying to them, hey, we can do this a little bit better. And that's a one-way ticket to procurement where you're going to be sort of bidding against you know, whatever competitor and trying to show how your cheaper option is better. But that also comes with risk for the customer. Right. Because they've got something. They know how it works. They know what to do with it. Their people know what to do with it. So why switch? Why yeah. switch? And and so that that has to be an overwhelming advantage from you know cost speed for that to work. And in our research, even then it's it's much less effective than finding a new problem. One of the um, the examples that you talk about in the book, just to lay it out in a, a very, very simplistic form, is bird's eye. And bird's eye, I, I think it was in the 40s or 50s, it could have even been earlier, um, you know, all vegetables were canned. It was difficult to, uh, you know, to bring product to market. They wanted to find, you know, freezers were becoming something very popular at the time. They wanted to provide um, a product that would not only differentiate from the category, but establish new customers based on need and basically mm -hmm. the technology, a freezer um, that was paving the way. So they started frozen food, frozen yeah. vegetables. And that um, was a very, very unique way of taking an existing marketplace yeah. and establishing something very new within it. So mm -hmm. that's one way of taking a look at category design. And then of course the competition, you know, followed very quickly after the other, which we're probably going to focus a little bit more on today is it is a brand new startup a brand new entrepreneurial vision, an innovator, a disruptor. What are we going to do to differentiate um, from mindset, from position, um, from you know market awareness to truly establish need for, for a customer set? Yeah, no, exactly. Well, so we wrote the book in 2016, Play Bigger, but category design, it was 1920 with Clarence Birdseye developing yeah. frozen food. Category design has been around since categories and categories have right. been around since humans. That's how we organize things. There's a sort of cognitive biases that I learned about in school that actually allow us to sort of navigate the world. They, we bucket things into categories. That's what we do. What interesting about the Clarence Birdseye example is a supermarket's a great place to explore categories. Because if you think about it, how many products are in your local Whole Foods? There's Tens of thousands. Exactly. I was going to say hundreds of millions. I know that's an exaggeration, but a lot. <laughs> yeah. So you go in there and you have a very specific dish that you want to make and it requires five ingredients. How are you possibly going to be able to find those things? And obviously right. it's not hard. You can go in 10 minutes later, you can be out. Why? Because in supermarkets, they have these things called aisles. And the aisles on top have usually a sign. And the sign tells you what's in that aisle, the categories right. of foods that are there. So you can then very quickly go about your business of, of making whatever it is that you're going to make, get those ingredients and get out of there. And it's categories that allow us to do that. So the Clarence yeah. Bird's Eye example, people at the time, the category of like vegetables, whatever's in season. And whatever isn't sort of rotting on the shelves at the time. Right. So you go in and you can get that and, you know, you, you can't eat um, whatever vegetable in the winter and the other one you can't eat in the summer. And that's just the way it is. There's a cost, you know, to, to doing things this way, but who can solve that? There's no possible solution for that. Mm -hmm. Clarence Birdseye, what's interesting about it, what he did is he found the problem that nobody was talking about and a way to solve it, right. which is to give people fresh vegetables all year long, but it doesn't stop there. So he, he had the idea for, for frozen foods because he was, um, he was traveling up North and he was exposed to an Inuit community and they were flash freezing their fish. Mm -hmm. That's how they did it. So that was the sort of original, what we call like now a technical insight, like, Hey, we could do something like that. Um, but what he also did was he created 
what we now call in category design a blueprint. So he has a problem, which is that you can't get fresh food all year round. And even when right. you can, it might be rotten, right? He has this technical insight, which is that you can flash freeze food and it will stay good all year round. But there are not, there's no freezer section in the supermarket. There's no refrigerated rail cars that you can take you know, from the farm to the supermarket and, or the market and freeze it. So he needs to build the infrastructure for the category. And we call this in modern category design, we call that developing a blueprint. Yeah. If you're going to be in this category, what if you can't you deliver. Need? Yeah, exactly. You can't just have frozen food. That's not going to work. You need to have the transportation and you need to have the infrastructure within the markets. Right. And so that becomes part of the blueprint. And when you have that, you can be successful. You just um, mentioned something um, that I think is really important. So he spent some time with the Inuit, not even you know anticipating ultimately what the outcome would be and, and not even really looking for it, um, which is research. Mm -hmm. And research uh, regarding product, market fit, you know, customer is the number one reason why startups fail. They think um, they've got a great idea. They're going to push it out to market. They think it will sell themselves. They don't have the research to be successful. In your years of communications and working with brands and now with category design with Play Bigger, what is the percentage of businesses you have seen not succeed because they haven't gone to market with the correct information to, to differentiate and, and succeed? Yeah. Well, I would say from, from the play bigger standpoint, usually we're having companies come to us because they've reached some kind of a impasse. They haven't been able to grow. So they're sort of in, in some ways you could say 100%, you know, there is something that's not working, right? We're not sure why let's, let's figure that out. And, and the answer is almost always, well, we haven't figured out the right problem to solve. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about how you but research. He was out with the Inuit, you know, doing some research, exploring. But what he did was he applied something that he observed, research, in a way that nobody had done before, mm -hmm. which moves it into insight. And the real important part of category design, in my mind, is the ability to unfocus and unlearn everybody with research the trap is you get into a linear kind of argument exactly you've seen this so then therefore that or there's no precedent for this so we shouldn't do that that's too risky you don't see the trees through the forest exactly yeah exactly and so ha having an ability to sort of unlearn and get comfortable with having an understanding and then taking a leap, having a vision for what the future could be. And a vision is not something that you can go back and prove beforehand. Mm -hmm. You can prove it after you've done the thing. And so I think yeah. that's part of it too, is how do you look at the research in a way that's going to change the way people you know, think and, and create new problems for them to solve? That's the real thing. And, and, and I think um, it takes consultants and agency people who aren't so closely knitted to the problem to ultimately help bring that out for the CEO or innovation team, the disruption team that's bringing the product to market. Um, they, they get too close to it. Yeah, totally. And one of the first things that we do when we work with companies is we send out this thing that we call the category assessment. It's like 15 questions and it's very straightforward. They're open-ended questions, but they're things like, what problem do you solve? Is the first yeah. question we ask. And the first thing I do when that comes back and we're preparing to do a work session with a new company is I create cluster maps where we look at the responses, you know, anywhere from, you know, 20 to 120 people respond to these things. And we start to break out the dimensions of the problem. And what's interesting is sometimes one individual, actually oftentimes one individual response 
will have two or three different problems within that response. Wow. What problem do you solve? It's you know a nice sentence that's coherent, but when you analyze it, you see there's actually like three different things happening there. So we start to plot these in a in a in a cluster map, and you can say, okay, we have these eight dimensions, and here are all of the responses that are sort of pertain to each one of these uh, dimensions. And sometimes there are responses that are in more than one dimension because of what I just mentioned. Oh, right. The first thing we do in our first working session is we confront the companies we're working with and we say, this is what you say. These are what you say the problems you solve are. Are any of these right? Right. Do they feel big enough? Are we missing any? And nine times out of 10, the problem that we end up solving for the category is usually the the one order of magnitude above everything that we've looked at. Everything In other words, defined. all of those problems are symptoms of something else. Right. And if you can define that problem, then you can build a successful category. And to the point, you know, we were just talking about, it's very difficult to see that when you're so close to it. I, I would imagine how often do you actually see that the players at the table are completely misaligned, um, that they've just got, you know, there's no continuity in thought. Yeah, that's such a good point. I'm glad you brought that. We we will put those things up and people who had been in violent agreement, you know, a month before they started working with us, all of a sudden are realizing that they have completely different conceptions of what they think the problem is or when we get to solution or uh, audience even you know, all of these different sort of facets of what we do, they start to realize that they're not aligned. Right. And it's not, it's not, they haven't been sort of, you know, passive aggressive and and like, hey, whatever, I'm not going to just talk to this person. They, they are not communicating. They're making assumptions that everybody's thinking about things in the same way that they are. And so what the process does, when you lay that bear in that cluster map, whether it's solution clusters, problems, whatever it is, you start to have these conversations and sometimes they get weird and uncomfortable. And always though, I find after the discomfort, we end up with something that's much stronger right. than we do when we have people who are like, eh, yeah, okay, I sort of agree with that. Um, so that's definitely a part of it, an important yeah. part of it. And I think to your point, like the consultant coming in and being able to it's an outside POV do that yeah without yeah. fear for our job you've already signed the contract you know yeah. here's, here's what we're we're gonna bring up difficult topics yeah and then you, and then we let people have at it you know I want to make sure as the audience is listening to this today that they don't have the idea that oh we can just go and do a SWAT a SWAT is going to give us a the the information we need to ultimately achieve what a category assessment will what are the key differences um, between those two tools? Well, I think SWOT is is a useful tool, and it's where you know it's a it's a way. Obviously, the input is the most important part, so it's just a sort of model for thinking, like what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I think what the what the assessment is intended to do is ask these very straightforward questions. So the SWOT is sort of we know the, and you're not asking questions per se, you're just sort of listing the different right. attributes. And I think what's important about the category assessment is that we are asking questions and then questioning the answers. Right. Why, 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 why? Always, yeah, the five whys and everything. Yeah, the most powerful word in marketing. <laughs> I mean, I have it's, a three, a three-year-old and a six and a half year old. So oh. this is my <laughs> master class in the why, why, why. I know, why. I know. It's so true. So you've got the category assessment, assessment, you're ultimately getting to the core of the problem, you're understanding audiences in a little bit more detail, what is next? Yeah, so we've got problem, who has that problem, then we say like, okay, well, what is the cost of this problem? Because if you have a real problem that's not solved or don't people don't think that they can solve, but there's no cost, who cares? Like right. what's the big deal? So what are the costs of that problem? And we start to sort of enumerate that to make sure that this is the right size problem. Then we move into what we call the solution and category name phase of the category design process. And so we start to look at that problem. We'll, we'll have a, um, we usually do this as a work session, the problem work, and then we'll have some time in between where we refine that into a problem statement. 
right? That will then have another work session and sort of read through, are we all agreed that this is the problem? And then we move into the solution and category name. And the way that we do that is similar. We show a sort of cluster map, what has happened or what do people think that the solution to this problem is? But then we do some exercises where we try to push people, um, which is very difficult, into thinking about the problem and what it would take to solve the problem right? without the company baggage associated with it. Let's just say if we were a new company, how would we solve this problem? And we start to list out what those components are. And then we kind of say, well, what do we have already? And how does that get applied? And what don't we have? Yeah. And there'll be a bunch of different components, you know, within that solution. And then you have to, you know, it's, it's, you have this really tight problem statement and then the solution is all of these things. Right. And that's not easy to communicate to people. Again, back to cognitive bias, too much information. It's not something that they'll be able to process and make a decision based on. So you have to name that thing, turn it into one thing. What is that called? That is the category name. So those two things would be the next thing that we do. And that naming is, you know, it's like the light bulb that goes off in someone's mind. They see that, that category. Um, and it, it can be a product name. It can be a company name. Uh, how does that ultimately come out uh, from a communication standpoint so that the customer immediately gets it and says, that's me. I need, I need to find out more. Yeah. So usually um, the, pr it, it, the product name will be derivative of the category. So the thing that we ask our companies to do is think about what we're doing as creating that category first, what would you call that category? And then what is your sort of version, the whatever category platform management, experience management, um, you know, from Qualtrics, the experience management platform or right. system, you know, th those are the ways that, that we try to think about that. How it comes up is we talk about the solution and then we have, we have like, you know, a few different kinds of thinking models. We help people walk through during our work sessions to try to get to reasonable category names. Usually they're like two or three words right? Um, and there are different types of words we'll usually prompt them with. Um, but the point is back to my friend, the anthropologist, the category name is not intended to be completely self-descriptive and self-evident. The point of view, which is what the the next couple of parts of our process are are sort of all about. That's what's important. That's where you're defining the problem, the solution, the costs, the blueprint, the outcomes. That is the meaning. And the job is to take that meaning and just like you know the the bros with the Miller Lite. Right. Saying, this is when I want to be myself. You're imbuing that meaning onto the beer. You're imbuing that meaning onto the category name. And, and so it's a receptacle in that way versus the, you know, self-defined, all-inclusive thing that everybody will get right away. And we're going to actually uh, share on screen here in a minute um, an actual output uh, from a category design um, nonprofit. You do a nonprofit um, program each year uh, for a, uh, a company of, that really ultimately needs help. And they want to be able to um, to impact community, society. You know, they've got a strong mission, so on and so forth. So the category um, design is save Westcliff, uh, something that's very near and dear to all the individuals within Play Bigger. Um, talk to us uh, in a few minutes, if you if you will, um, yeah. over you know what you did for for that organization and the impact uh, it's made since then. Yeah, so so Al Ramadan, founder, CEO of Play Bigger, um, lives in Santa Cruz, right off of West Cliff, West Cliff Drive, um, and he is a surfer, a sailor, anything to do with the water. Al's there. He started his career with the America's Cup. Um, he he loves the ocean, um, and he loves um, he loves West Cliff. So there were some torrential rains uh, over the winter, and the uh, as a result, there was some grave damage to Westcliff Drive, where it was actually um, sent into the ocean. Wow. And so as Al talks about it, he got a call from the uh, former mayor who let him know what was happening. Now, obviously, there's a sort of 
plan in place for how you sort of repair this damage. And there were road crews already on the scene and they were going to try to fix it. But what she said to him is, if we don't do something about this, this is going to keep happening. Right. So how do we actually protect Westcliff in this sort of recreation area? And so Al, as the sort of, you know, godfather of category design, sees that this is a category problem. The category problem being we need a way to protect this area without giving up all the benefits that it has to the community. So, right. you know, as you might imagine, there are ways that you could stop storm damage, such as seawalls and, and uh, you know, other kinds of things that would restrict access and totally change the ecosystem and the way that people use, um, use, the, use the ocean there and the sort of legendary surf um, in Santa Cruz. So, do you do that? Or is there another kind of way that you could solve that? Mm -hmm. And so they started doing some research to your point about research on um, what this area had looked like over the years. Um, and there's academics that helped them do this. And they're looking at um, pictures from hundreds of years ago that show the development of the area and how it had changed over time. The natural features, in other words, had started to um, be less natural, more right. um, sort of manipulated by uh, people. And so the category, when they started to think about how do we actually solve this problem, the category that they came up with was called natural feature restoration. And the idea was instead of building seawalls or instead of just leaving ourselves vulnerable to these catastrophic events, which are becoming more and more frequent, we can create a new category of development called natural feature restoration that will allow us to go back and redevelop some of these things that were lost either because mm -hmm. of um, improvements you know from 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 uh, people who live there or natural processes of erosion um, and and decay that happen and sort of deteriorate what was once protecting that harbor and that recreation area. That's great. Um, <clears throat> and as yeah. you're ex as you're explaining all this, um, you know, we've got the graphic up on screen, so you can kind of see how everything um, tears up and loops back um, and connects uh, to ultimately, you know, pushing this out to the marketplace. So thank you very very much uh, for sharing that example with us. Something um, that I I want to dive into next is the value of categories design when it comes to investments, um, whether it be VC, a series A, a, you know, a seed round, whatever it might be, um, they either have a category design um, in place or they know that they want to get there. Um, and VCs are valuing that. Um, let's talk a little bit ab about um, the outcome that this can play downstream uh, when business leaders take the time to invest. Yeah, so our research shows a pretty clear sort of benefit to category design. When you look at um, category champs, those are the ones that are really dominating their categories. Um, and you look at sort of market share for these categories, what you see is a pretty clear trend. In fact, 76% of the market cap in a given category will go to that category dominant that leader. player, the category yeah. champ, as we call them. Yeah, so there is this sort of um, economic benefit that happens by defining and then dominating a category. There is also a bit of a sort of, it, you, you don't define a category and then tomorrow you have an enormous category that's worth billions and you're getting 76% of that. There's a development period that's involved as well usually between one to three years where you start to then realize the sort of growth of that, of that right. category. And of course, Uber is a great example of that. Um, you know, that is, you know, the, the category um, that just, that it, you know, it wasn't just new category design, but it disrupted, you know, a hundred year industry, 120 year industry or more um, that was just the same thing day in and day out. Yeah, yeah. So you think about rideshare, you know, the category that that Uber created, you know, back when they were starting zero billion dollar category. No, there's no money there. It's that doesn't exist right. because it's a problem. Everybody, that's an example of a problem. Everybody knows that they have. Um, you know, I'm from New York, so I oh, so like, you know very well. The, the if it's raining and you're on Sixth Avenue and you want to get a cab before Uber, 
you're there for an hour. No yeah. question. It's never going to come. Um, and then when you do get in, the cab driver tells you he doesn't want to go to wherever you live and you know you have no opportunity. It's terrible. It sucks. It is the worst experience. But what are you going to do? If you live somewhere else, you have to call a taxi. Maybe they show up. Maybe they don't. It sucks. It's terrible. But that's the cost of that kind of transportation. That's just how it is. But what if it wasn't just how it is? What if we could figure out a way to solve that problem right? and allow people to not have to go through that experience? And of course, that is the sort of problem that, that Uber took aim at with Rideshare, um, helping people realize that they can actually not have to wait on Sixth Avenue in the rain, that there's a taxi right in their pocket and they can be connected with people who want to drive them, not who are going to say, no, I don't feel like going downtown right now, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was a, it was a huge step change as a result. And, and obviously their, um, their category dominance and market share is a great example of what happens when you define that category and then um, continue to push category, category, category. You know, they were constantly talking about the problem of getting you know, a, a ride or a taxi or a black car, and then the category of ride share, and then Uber in that order. Yeah. It's really important to do it that way. Well, I, I think there's a lot of astuteness um, in being able to sit back and, you know, not go for the gusto out of the chute and take the time to, you know, actually ladder up and educate the market on need um, before, which takes, you know, I, you know, it takes a lot of um, patience, to be able to sit back and say, okay, this is this is the way we're going to ultimately have a slam dunk. Um, you work with a lot of CEOs. I work with a lot of CEOs. How tough is it to get them to realize, you know, you you got to sit back and and ladder this up and wait back and be, be patient. Yeah, no, it's tough. It, so category design involves a lot of unlearning. Yeah. And there are traditional ways that you're supposed to identify a TAM, you know, the, the market that you can go after, the category that you're going to be in that Gartner has already sort of identified. That's the way that people learn to size their potential. Right. And what we're saying is kind of throw that out the window, forget about the existing category. You're not, we're not interested in TAM, we're interested in category potential. Right. What could this new category become if we solve that problem? And it is almost always orders of magnitude higher than if you were in the existing category, because that unsolved problem has so much pent up need that people don't even realize they have that once you are able to sort of solve that, identify the problem and then solve it, the category has a, has a much higher potential. And then as that sort of leader, that first mover who's defined it, you are much more likely to end up in that dominant position where then you're able to capture 76% of that instead of focused right. on what you're going to steal from the 76% incumbent somewhere else. We, we were talking uh, about something that I think will be interesting for our listeners right now um, in our pre-show uh, about a month ago, which uh, we were chatting about the ineffectiveness of marketing and about 80% of marketing is ineffective because it's just strictly focused on feature benefit, feature benefit. And it doesn't focus on the emotion behind the problem that is being solved. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say this is the benefit of our, our product. You have to, as we've just illustrated with, with Uber, Rideshare, that's the problem being solved. And then you get into the rest. Yeah, and that's a good B2C example. Obviously, it's a sort of uh, multi-sided marketplace there, but that's a good example there. Often, too, we work with a lot of B2B tech companies and, and other companies as well. They're not all tech. Um, but with the B2B, one of the things that we focus on is with that problem statement, when you hear it as an executive, your reaction should be to start sweating. Yeah. If we've identified the, the, the right problem, it should make you wake up in the middle of the night because you had that conversation with one of these companies and, and you realize, yeah, I do have that problem. And that then is what moves you from, like I said, the commodity space into a line item and a budget because you have a problem that's keeping you up at night that you know when you hear it is, is a legitimate problem with real costs. 
and you have no way of solving it until now. This category is going to do it. These people who have identified that problem know what they're talking about. Let's bring them in. Let's sign the contract, not let's negotiate against all these other five companies that do yeah. the same thing because there aren't any. Yeah, I love it. Uh, you know, it's hard as service organizations to ultimately come up with great category strategies. But the more you dig in, the more you problem solve, the more you get into the mindset, um, the more you look at yourself as a non-commodity driven, you know, marketplace. I mean, take a look at Deloitte. Um, and, you know, they started out as accounting, then they became consulting, and now they are one of the most... Um, sought after consultancies out there that day in and day out provides insights and intuitiveness that solves people people's problems before they know they exist. Yeah, solving problems is always, and that, that's one of the things that sort of always like before when I was working in, you know, some of the, the um, comm strategy, the, the problems, trying to get people to apply those problems to their business and not just their very specific thing was what attracted me to category design. Now being in category design, I'm always surprised at how few companies are problem oriented. And you yeah. see when they are, it's it, you could pick any company that's been successful and you can see the problem. Yeah. You look at I, these giant unicorns, you look at these huge public companies and you see exactly what you saw, you know, a problem that's being solved. Yeah, I love it. Before we um, leave today, this has been such a great conversation. We're in an economic downturn. Um, it's, you know, it's uh, July 18th that we're taping this of, of mm -hmm. 2023, uh, just so that we've got that, um, that mark on this. And we're, you know, three years post or not post COVID we're mm -hmm. you know, 18 months post COVID, mm -hmm. um, you know, middle of March, 2020, you know, the sky was falling. Mm -hmm. And when COVID started, uh, there was a massive influx of entrepreneurialism, the largest increase of people starting businesses in the U S history. And we're in an economic downturn. Once mm -hmm. again, we're seeing a lot of new businesses and startups hit the market. We're also seeing Entities like Crunchbase constantly pushing out information about the mm -hmm. fact that funding is way down. What mm -hmm. do you have to say about that? I mean, it's such a weird time, isn't it, with the, it is. the economy and and especially even you know here we are July 18th and and um, inflation news seems somewhat positive. Seems like the markets are penciling in a sort of end to Fed increases um, after the next one. They so, better at eight and a half percent. So yeah, so 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 what we've seen right now is something interesting, which is that it seems like the VC funded startup world in the last week or two has sort of woken up. We've been getting way more calls than we normally do um, for category design. There's more cash freed up. It's an interesting time. But, but one of the things that was really interesting that we did at the uh, beginning of the year was we looked at, we wanted to see like, what is the impact of economic downturn on category champs? Like, is it positive, negative, indifferent? And what we found was two things. One, we found that about half of the companies that we track, which are, these are the companies that are um, category uh, leaders dominating in, in every possible way. And um, when you think of, you know, massive companies like Google, um, you know, Meta and, and many, many others, these are the sort of companies that we track. Right. You see that more than half of them were established during an economic downturn. Wow. Which is interesting. And, you know, there's some wisdom to that. People talk about, you know, recession being a great opportunity for innovation. It's also seemingly a great innovation for category design. Mm -hmm. One other piece of interesting um, research that we did at the time was while series, you know, like late stage growths, funding, even like mid-stage funding down, like way, way, way down, um, double digit percentage down in funding. Um, what you saw in seed and series A was a much higher funding rate right. than those others. So there are way more companies being funded at that level um, than any of the others. And in fact, it's continued to increase. I just read somewhere that it was a, on a record, record bracing, breaking pace. Um, so what you're seeing is these VCs are putting money into longer term investments, right? We're and putting money into longer term investments as things were kind of getting screwy. Yeah. 
and less and, money, broader, you know, more investments. Exactly. And so yeah. that creates a great opportunity for the next round, what we call the category entrance, the next round of, you know, would be category champs to start to develop and then, you know, identify what their problem is early on. And so we, what we expect is in, you know, three to five years, you're going to see an explosion of what we call the category champs or these like, you know, undisputed leaders of their yeah. categories. It's amazing. I, you know, I am such a fan um, of the process. I'm a fan of the book, Play Bigger. Um, and Mike, I'm, I'm your new fan as well. <laughs> You've been fantastic today. And I really appreciate you sharing um, just incredible insights that really spark interest um, within the mindset of our listeners today. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO with a very, very early stage uh, startup, or if you're the first hire as a marketing director, um, really trying to rein in everything happening within the company, and, and you've got some growth to 100 employees or 200 employees in the next two years, this is very, 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 very important uh, piece of really establishing growth and, and market positioning. Um, how, what is the best way for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, they can play bigger.com is probably the best place to go. We right. have a contact us. You could put in um, your information and we reach out to everybody who 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 submits on, on play bigger.com. That is by far the best way to reach us. You can also check us out on our socials, play bigger on LinkedIn, um, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram uh, as well. And I must say, you've got an incredible newsletter. Um, that yes. I subscribe to. Um, so sign up for that as well. Mike Bruno, thank you so much for your appearance on the Lori, Energy and Ignite podcast. Lori, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me out. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, Mike. This episode is complete. Head over to avocetcommunications.com for more ways to scale and grow your business. And be sure to tune in regularly for insights and motivation with host Lori Jones and her guests on the Integrate and Ignite Marketing Podcast.